Welcome to O'Reilly Radar, our new show highlighting the big ideas and key people on our radar. Each week at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern, we'll be broadcasting a collection of interviews and analysis that examine emerging technologies and more. You can also watch each episode on the O'Reilly Media YouTube channel and subscribe to the O'Reilly Radar podcast through iTunes. In this week's episode, I interview author Alistair Allen about ubiquitous computing. We take a look at top stories published across O'Reilly's platforms, and author Peter Myers discusses EPUB 3, HTML5, and the Kindle Fire. Now let's get things started with some news. It's been a long time since digital music was the hot topic, but the release of two new services have pushed music back into the spotlight. First up is Google Music, which is now publicly available. With Google Music, users can store 20,000 songs for free. New tracks and albums can also be purchased through the Android market. Most notable, Google Music makes a user's collection available across various devices. In a related and earlier move, Apple pushed out its iTunes Match service. iTunes Match scans a user's iTunes collection and matches it up with Apple's archive in the cloud. That means a user does not have to spend hours or days uploading a massive music collection. Like Google Music, iTunes Match makes a subscriber's music collection available across devices. Unlike Google, there's a fee. iTunes Match goes for $24.99 per year. Now, each system is interesting on its own, but there's a broader aspect to these services that we're tracking closely on radar. Specifically, as consumer cloud services roll out and catch on, we're charting a shift from digital content ownership to digital content access. The question is, which model will emerge as the default? Is the middle ground approach we're seeing now where you store your content, but you still seem to own it merely an interim step? Long term, will we continue to gravitate toward ownership because we're hardwired to hoard things? Or is access simply the better option in a cloud-based world? There's lots of big questions, and we'll be monitoring the evolution of access versus ownership in the months ahead. Please weigh in with your own thoughts through radar.oreilly.com or on Radar's Google Plus page. O'Reilly's Tools of Change for Publishing Conference, being held February 13th through 15th, 2012 in New York City, is where the publishing and tech industries converge. Practitioners and executives from both camps will share what they've learned and joined together to navigate publishing's ongoing transformation. Learn more and register to attend Tools of Change for Publishing by visiting toccon.com. That's T-O-C-C-O-N.com. I'm joined now by author Alistair Allen, and we're going to talk a little bit about the iPhone 4S hardware and augmented reality. Alistair, thanks so much for being with us. Always good. So the uh, iPhone 4S has come out. Have you popped the hood on that thing yet? Got one right here. All right, so what, what are your impressions thus far? I mean, how does it compare to uh, the previous model? Uh, and I'm talking more in terms of the internals, you know, the different sensors that you're seeing, how the hardware compares against past generations, that sort of thing. Um, it's definitely faster, um, a lot faster. Um, I've done side-by-side comparisons on with my previous iPhone 4, and you're suddenly getting a lot of speed up. Um, anecdotally, at least, I'm getting some... Uh, some increased resolution on the um, accelerometer and gyroscope and I don't know whether that's just me thinking it all works better or whether it's down to the faster processor Um, so I don't have hard numbers for that I can certainly verify that the battery drain issue is there Um, I have very short battery lives especially when um, when I enable any location sensors, so I think I think it's something to do with the GPS or the core location stack or something like that. And what's your impression of the camera? The camera is wonderful. I love the camera. Um, it's really improved. I mean, the the the, the hardware differences is got a uh, backlit sensor, um, and there's a bunch of other stuff that they've done to the actual hardware on the chip that that at least for me has really seriously improved things. And I know everyone says it's not about megapixels, but it really isn't about megapixels. I mean, cameras mm-hmm. are something I know fairly well, at least the, the chips behind cameras, because we use them a lot um, for astronomy. With CCDs or something we know a lot about. And it really isn't about the number of pixels. It's, you know, there's the, the optics is important too, and the optics seem to have been very much improved in the 4S. So, um, yeah, the camera's a big improvement, actually. Um, yeah, did something... you see the, well, did you see the, sorry, did you see the, um, the hidden panorama mode? No, I didn't. There's a hidden panorama mode. Uh, so if you, if you Google, if you Google for how to enable this, basically what you need to do is you need to actually pull a backup into iTunes, and you can tweak a conference, uh, config file and mm-hmm. pull it back into the device, and it'll actually, it actually does in OS panoramas. No kidding. So it'll actually tile the images really? for you. So it's hidden. It's in there. It's hidden. They just didn't tell anyone about it. 
It's, you just uh, have to tweak sneaky. a config file. You don't have to jailbreak, and it's all done. No kidding. So it's a legitimate hack that'll work, and presumably not it, break. Well, it, so legitimate for certain values of legitimate, sure. But <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I mean, something this, that. Uh, sorry, uh, go ahead. No, you go on. So something that we've talked about before is the intersection of mobile and augmented reality, and in a lot of ways, you know, the hardware is not necessarily ready for prime time. The software yeah. is not necessarily ready for prime time. How close does the 4S get us to enabling that in a legitimate way beyond just sort of opening up an app and trying to see if there's hidden messages floating around us? Um, I mean, I think I think we're running in place with the 4S. Uh, it, the, the extra CPU is useful, and the camera is much better. But it's still you standing in the street, sort of yeah. doing this, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Which, well, I don't, I don't know about you, but it makes me feel really stupid. So uh, it's not something I'm going to be doing very often. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think I think the the current generation of mobile devices are a really, really good prototyping platform for mm -hmm. you know future augmented reality um, and other such things. Um, I think. I, mean, I think I, I did a radar post about this at one point, didn't I? It's um, basically the current generation devices aren't aren't where we're heading. We're trying to recreate, you know, a desktop computer in a different form factor, and that's not really what augmented reality, ubiquitous computing, is all about. Um, so I think I think it's a good proving ground, but I don't think it's really you know gets as much further forward at this point. So to clarify on that, though, when you're talking, your your vision of augmented reality is not, you know, we've got the little camera up and we're seeing thought bubbles above restaurants. Yeah, it's it's the intersection of small embedded devices and personal area networks. Is that right? That that's very much it. Yeah, I mean, I think I think in the future, uh, our mobile phone will probably be our only computer. I mean, sure. if you look at the the 11 inch MacBook Air, what's mostly there is, um, well, screen. It has to be 11 inches around because it has to be 11 inches around, so the screen's 11 inches, right? Right. Um, but the actual, if you if you took the screen away and you took the keyboard away and you folded that down, the bulk of it is a battery and the solid state drive. And within soon, yeah. you can probably right. fit that into here, and you can fit that into here a lot easier when you take. Whoop, try to actually get this on the in the camera. <laughs> take the screen away. Right. So, if it's, so basically, if you just have this block of processing power and you hook that into a network of ubiquitous devices, um, so you have a set of glasses for display, and that's not really going to be practical until the glasses you wear for a augmented reality display are, well, look pretty much like the glasses you're wearing now. Right. Because otherwise no one's going to wear them, right? We're used right. to people wearing glasses that look like glasses, but glasses that look like some bond doggle with, you know, things yeah, hanging like off them and wires and stuff. Thing, right? Yeah. Not so much, um, but so that's going to be a display. I mean, there's going to be uh, you can actually you can actually do things to have virtual keyboards, right? So you can you can wire up the clothing so that you can actually have uh, positional information on your arms, for instance, and um, and you can actually do at that point you can actually do um, have a camera attached into the the, the thing of the the leg of the glasses and you can do a virtual keyboard that's projected onto your glasses so you don't really need a physical keyboard mm -hmm. you can do you can censor up the clothing you can have this top bar network to your surroundings so you're walking towards the train station you, your computer your calendar knows that you need to catch a certain train so that automatically does situational awareness to your geo, geo fencing and you know up in the in hanging in the air in front of you is the current position of the train. You have a little map where the train is. You know, it's like two stations away. You know, you've got five minutes. You can stop for your latte. It's all good. <laughs> so, really I mean, that out. yeah, well, I mean, this is it. It's like you have to, yeah, you, you have to think about how. Okay, my main line of argument is that general purpose computers are dead. Mm. The thing that you you buy and is a box with a screen and a keyboard that you can run arbitrary applications on is dead. It might take five years, it might take ten years, but they are dying and, and they are going. It's like people never wanted that. They never wanted to be able to install printer drivers. Sure. Okay. They never wanted to muck around with video drivers or display resolutions or any of that stuff. They just wanted what computers could do for them. They wanted to write a text document without having to get you know their fingers caught in the typewriter keys. 
they wanted to be able to do um, spreadsheets without, you know, uh, having to have big rolls of paper in everywhere. They wanted to make drawings without, you know, having stacks of paper everywhere and ink stains all over their fingers. Mm -hmm. They wanted the, the capabilities of the computers. They didn't want to have to install printer drivers or video drivers or try and mass, uh, install different types of libraries to, um, you know, cross, you know, install, you know, glibc2, which, and this one's compiled with glibc1.6. It's like, wrong version of the compiler. Oh, we need to install this library. People don't care. Right. Geeks care. I care. You might care. No one else really cares. It's not interesting to people. And the ubiquitous computer vision, the, the augmented reality vision, ubiquitous computing, is about be embedding the, the computing into your environment. It's not changing you to, to use new types of interfaces. It's you reusing the interfaces of commonly available things to make the computing accessible. So right. that um, obvious examples, very simple examples are starting to come into mainstream now. Um, Taps, for instance. Have you seen the taps where the, the, the color of the water is blue if it's cold or red if it's warm? I have not, no. Okay, so there's some really cool taps. You can, actually, you can buy them off the shelf now. It actually has a, has a uh, uh, thermometer in the, the water stream and it will mm -hmm. change a multicolored LED to be, you know, to blue when the water is cold and red when it's hot. So you can actually look right. at the water running in, your, in the tap in your, you know, in your sink, in your kitchen, and you, and you can figure out whether you're going to put your hand underneath it or not. Right. So, you know, that's, that's a, a classic example of a very low-level device that, that has been enabled for ubiquitous computing. Right. So, last question for you. Do, do you think that we need to get rid of the phrase augmented reality? I mean, is that, is that, is that a hitch right now, or are we too uh, attached to that notion of the thought bubbles with augmented reality, and should we instead be playing up the notion of ubiquitous computing? Um, I, I think both of them are a hitch. I think, I think the phraseology of um, augmented reality and ubiquitous computing, I think they're buzzwords and people don't understand what they mean. Um, I was at AuraDev last week and I was listening to Amber Case talk about ubiquitous computing without once mentioning the phrase ubiquitous computing in her hour-long sure. keynote. Um, and their entire thing was all about uh, geolocation and geofencing and ubiquitous computing. And, and augmented reality, and she didn't mention the buzzword once, and I was really impressed with that because I probably couldn't have managed to do that myself. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, mean, I think the everyone goes ubiquitous computing. Oh, I, oh, I don't know. Is but but then if you think about it, if you give people examples of what it can do, they go, oh yeah, that's really cool. So I was mm -hmm. trying to persuade the other day, um, and it was we're in a stuffy meeting room. And there was uh, air conditioning, and we were trying to get, and you know, everyone was trying to decide. You know, we were trying to persuade people that we wanted the room cooler. Or, you know, it, some people actually were cold, so they wanted it hotter. What if your mobile phone talked to the air conditioner automatically and pull mm -hmm. and said, "I, my person, likes the air condition. You know, the the room at twenty Celsius," and you can actually build up a poll a spread map of who wanted what temperature and you can actually come to some sort of mean or mode for the room and then everyone right. wouldn't stop complaining because at least it would be fair it's been you know voted on your device right. did a vote and everyone else's devices voted and the temperature it's at now is some sort of you know average that makes everyone the least unhappy so really we need to bring democracy to our thermostats is that yes. that's what you're telling us right okay that's a good that's a good way to do it you can, you can use that one in your next post. I think so. That's, that's a good title for a post, <laughs> isn't it? I think we'll, we'll try that. <laughs> we'll work that one out. Well, thanks so much for being with us. Really appreciate you taking no worries. the time. Always good. Here's a look at three of the top stories recently published across O'Reilly's platforms. In Tim O'Reilly's Thoughts on eBooks post, he discusses O'Reilly's history with digital books. Tim notes, quote, our original ebook vision was of a world in which ebooks would be published in standard formats and could be read on any device, and where dominance of a particular piece of software or a particular e reading device would not lock people in. End quote. In her piece Confessions of a Not So Public Speaker, Suzanne Axtell says that stepping out of our comfort zones and into the spotlighted events can address the perception that the tech community is solely populated by young white guys. And finally, Doug Hill takes a provocative and thought-provoking look at America's technological schizophrenia in his piece, Steve Jobs, the Unabomber, and America's Love-Hate Relationship with Technology. 
You can find links to all these stories at radar.oreilly.com slash show. One of the great things about O'Reilly's events is that it gives us an opportunity to sit down in person with some fascinating folks. At youtube.com slash O'Reilly Media, you'll find a large archive of interviews, presentations, and keynotes. During each episode of O'Reilly Radar, we'll be featuring one of those videos. This week, we have a chat with Peter Myers, author of Best iPad Apps and the upcoming title, Breaking the Page, Transforming Books and the Reading Experience. In this interview, Pete discusses the role EPUB 3 and HTML5 will play in future content, and he also offers some early thoughts on the Amazon Kindle Fire. So what are your thoughts on EPUB 3, HTML5, and standalone book apps? How do all of those work together, or are they competing against each other? Yeah, well, I think there is, we're at a point of divergence. You know, it's slow divergence, but I think what we're going to see in each of those categories is different kinds of books gravitate to different kinds of formats. Mm. So I think the majority of books in the future won't be customized apps. And the ones that do will get developed into apps are those that really feel more app-like. They're the ones that really feel like they need to provide more interactivity, more manipulation mm -hmm. um, um, of, of objects and, and, and things that only apps can do. I mean, I'm thinking about things like studies of astronomy or um, anatomical models yeah. or things where you really, you know, you want to let the, the, the user really get in there and, 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 and dig through. Now, as EPUB 3 comes and more of the um, e-reading platforms adopt it, mm -hmm. I think we're going to start seeing um, EPUB books do app-like things, but not quite as complex and as customized as the apps. Not to, you know, for 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 a, one of the biggest reasons is because of the cost of development mm -hmm. um, to create apps. You know, I mean, to really do a nice app, especially a one-off, a customized um, production, is north of a hundred thousand right. dollars. And the fact is that most publishers, the familiarity that they have right now are with technologies like HTML and JavaScript and CSS, and mm -hmm. that's what goes into EPUB 3. Now, as far as HTML5 goes, that's still a bit of a wild card. Um, there's a one publisher, um, I want to say Scientific America, who's recently um, experimented with, uh, sorry, it's Nature, who's recently mm -hmm. ex experimented right. with a, they call it a living textbook. Mm -hmm. It's a biology textbook that they've done in HTML5 that they're going to continuously update. The question really, I think, is more of a, um, a transactional one. Are people willing to pay for web-based content? You know, to date they've proven largely reluctant to do so, mm -hmm. but as HTML5 starts getting more um, um, complex and more fully supported, I think we're going to start seeing more, um, some experimentation. Mm -hmm. Do feature-rich apps scale? I mean, are, are publishers in a position now where they've got to basically start from scratch? I, d I think so. I think, you know, I've been having this discussion actually quite a bit recently, and, and, and I think it's really starting to um, become a, a kind of top of mind question for a lot of publishers who've experimented once or twice mm -hmm. with some pretty substantial customized apps that have cost north of $100,000, and they've either had some success or they've failed completely to sell any. But what, they've, what they're left with are these really expensive productions, and then the question is, well, can I use this again? Mm -hmm. in some of my other titles. And I think in most cases, as much as wishful thinking would suggest that they want to reuse the code base and the information architecture and all mm -hmm. and so on, they're really not, it's like taking a movie and saying, you right. know, I want to be able to, to, to reuse the movie. Now what I think we will see for those publishers who are interested on a consistent basis in developing apps are movie studio-like areas mm -hmm. of expertise. Mm -hmm. So they'll have <coughs> art design, art directors who are comfortable in doing interactive art, and mm -hmm. they'll have copywriters who can work on a, you know, in an app-like medium. Um, but I'm highly skeptical that publishers themselves are going to start developing in-house app development mm -hmm. capabilities, because as that production becomes more complex and keeps getting more complex over the next couple years, as Windows 8 Metro comes into the picture, mm -hmm. and Android, and iPhone. Right. It's too expensive for publishers who, frankly, have a challenging enough time keeping up with just straight EPUB publishing. Mm -hmm. What impact do you think the Amazon tablet's going to have? 
I think the tablet is going to, the, the, the Kindle tablet or whatever they end up calling it, will, will sort of be fighting a, a fight on two fronts. One against the Color Nook and one mm -hmm. against the iPad. Mm -hmm. And against the iPad, I think they're really going to be um, um, competing for the attention and the, the purchasing decision of people who aren't ready or interested in spending 500, 600, mm -hmm. 700 bucks. From everything we've been hearing, the Amazon tablet's going to come in at 250 bucks mm -hmm. and do quite a bit with all of the media and content that Amazon has been assembling you know, over the past couple of years. That will then bring them in direct competition with the Color Nook, which sells for 250 bucks, mm -hmm. surprise, surprise. And I think it's really going to be challenging for Barnes & Noble because Barnes and Noble, while they've really, you know, accomplished quite a bit with the Color Nook and gotten great reviews and people love it and they're selling quite a bit, they don't have the full collection of content and services that Amazon is able to offer. Mm -hmm. Last question for you, and it's a big question. Um, do you envision a future where publishers, as we currently define that term, that whole notion is irrelevant? I think the short answer is no. Um, I mean, I'm currently writing a book, and it happens to be for O'Reilly, and I'm facing on a daily and weekly and monthly basis a sort of uh, uh, th this sort of question of, well, what is O'Reilly doing for me? If I can mm -hmm. be so bold to sure. say that sure, in the middle sure. of an interview with O'Reilly, and I think you know, without a doubt, the relationship between a publisher and an author are changing. And frankly, when I think about my own case, what I'm getting out of my relationship um, with O'Reilly are things like a platform to publicize and tell my story about mm -hmm. what I'm writing about, which is the future of books. Um, I get technological support. Um, we're developing an EPUB 3 version that I could do on my own, but would be pretty expensive sure. to, to, to do. Um, what I don't get, and I think no author really, or few authors get nowadays, um, is a lot of hand holding, a lot of individual attention, right. a lot of like minute line editing yep. and daily phone calls saying go, 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 you're great, you're per <laughs> you know, that stuff. Sure. We're all trying to make money now and get projects done in this new digital world. Yeah. And I think an author needs to go into these writing projects with this expectation that they're going to have to do as much work um, as the public for the publisher and for the book mm -hmm. as the publisher is doing for them. Right. Interesting. Well, thanks so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. You're welcome. We're just about to wrap things up here on O'Reilly Radar, but before we go, we wanted to pass along a few closing notes. You can find an archive of this episode at youtube.com slash O'Reilly Media. You can also subscribe to the O'Reilly Radar podcast through iTunes. All links featured in this episode are also available at radar.oreilly.com slash show. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you again soon.